1863 is a pivotal year in determining the outcome of the war between the states. Three significant battles prove to be turning points in the conflict. The first takes place at Vicksburg along the Mississippi River. Ulysses S. Grant had been attempting to attack Vicksburg since December of 1862. Uh, he wore a, a lot of road maps <laughs> and um, a lot of energy attempting to approach the city. Ultimately, his campaign was brilliant, crossing the Mississippi below the city, attacking the supply line or capturing Jackson, Mississippi, and then moving down the railroad toward Vicksburg, bringing Vicksburg into a state of siege. That siege lasted 40 some odd days from uh, May of 63 to the 4th of July when the, uh, John C. Pemberton, the Confederate commander, finally had to surrender. And in so doing, surrendered a very large army, 30,000 troops, plus all the artillery and equipment that uh, supplied that army. Once Vicksburg had fallen, Port Hudson, which was really the last Confederate stronghold, was doomed. Then the United States controlled the Mississippi River from one end to the other. At the same time the Vicksburg campaign is going on, Lee invades Pennsylvania. Seeking again a climactic battle, a battle of annihilation to destroy the Union Army. The Union Army, commanded by Joseph Hooker, followed Lee cautiously into Pennsylvania Hooker kept asking for reinforcements that the United States did not have. Finally, Abraham Lincoln lost confidence in Hooker and replaced him with George G. Meade less than a week before a battle that would really go a long way toward determining the winner in the American Civil War. The two armies meet at the small town of Gettysburg. Meade's army positions itself on the hills south of town, a location that is well protected. General Lee and his troops attack their position at Cemetery Ridge, but are driven back. Lee launched an assault on the third day in what is known as Pickett's Charge. That turned out to be a gallant disaster with the loss of a tremendous percentage of Confederate casualties. Lee, in the midst of a horrendous rainstorm on July 4th, began the retreat back into Virginia. Once again, Lincoln was dismayed that Meade had not followed up his victory after Gettysburg. We had them in the palm of our hand, Lincoln said, supposedly, and let them go. Well, Meade's army was every bit as battered as Lee's, but significantly, Lee went back into Virginia with roughly one-third less men than he had them when he crossed the Potomac and launched his campaign. Never again will Confederate forces be able to seriously threaten Northern Territory. Before the end of the year, there is a third important turning point, this one in Tennessee. After occupying Chattanooga, Union forces under William Rosecrans pursue the retreating Confederate troops. The Confederate Army actually lured Rosecrans' troops into following various elements of the Bragg's Army. Bragg then was able to concentrate his forces along uh, Chickamauga Creek and attack and fight the Battle of Chickamauga, which was a resounding Confederate victory. And that assault threatened to cut off the base of supply of the Union Army at Chattanooga and also its, its right of retreat. And Rosecrans led the retreat from Gamaga in extreme northwest Georgia back into Chattanooga. Bragg followed military wisdom, says, too slowly. Some of Bragg's subordinates ask a private who had escaped Union captivity to meet with Bragg. And Bragg, being a very pompous sort of commander, was very upset that a private in his army was telling him the nature of uh, the campaign. Consequently, he said, Private, do you even know what a retreat looks like? And the private supposedly responded, I ought to, General. I've been with you throughout all of your campaigns. Undeterred, Bragg continues his methodical fortification of the surrounding hills. And for a time, actually had Rosecrans in a very, very bad box because he controlled Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge and was able to shell the city, was able to cut off the supply of the Union forces. And indeed, legend has it that federal arses were dying of starvation in Chattanooga. 
It was at this point that President Lincoln names Ulysses S. Grant commander of the Western Theater of War, all of the territory west of the Appalachian Mountains. Grant then, fresh from his victory at Vicksburg, again this is September of 1863, brought troops and organization into Chattanooga. He opened up a uh, railroad supply line into the city, removed Rosecrans from command, and began restoring some semblance of organization and supply to the Federal Army at Chattanooga. Meanwhile, Bragg did not much. His position surrounding the city, as subsequent events would demonstrate, was not that strong. By November, Grant is ready to make his move. He first was able to compel Bragg to withdraw the forces from Lookout Mountain, which is a huge, huge promontory overlooking all of Chattanooga. George H. Thomas's sizable Army of the Cumberland was to be the, uh, the force that would fix the Confederate troops in place, force them to pay attention to their front. The real action was supposed to take place on the Confederate front. As it happened, these forces were not as successful as it had hoped. However, George H. Thomas's troops, having captured the first line of Confederate rifle pits, did not stop. They all but spontaneously kept going up Missionary Ridge. As the campaigning season of 1863 wound down, the Union was in control of Chattanooga, an important rail junction, and had run the Confederates back into North Georgia. On the Eastern Front, Lee and Meade are involved in a series of skirmishes that have little impact in terms of the larger war. And so the campaigning season in 1863 wound down, and really, if you look at it uh, on a map, it doesn't look like that much has changed, but a great deal has changed, in fact. The Confederacy has gotten weaker, the, the armies have grown smaller, and the war of attrition is at work. The Confederate war experience was very different in many ways from the Northern war experience, simply because most of the battles were fought on Southern ground. So in 1862 and 1863, the Confederate population was deprived of foodstuffs. They were deprived of many of the things that they took for granted. But much more important than that was the destruction that the Union armies started to wreak on Southern territory and Southern population. This was terrible, and yet, I will have to say that Southern victory often made those sacrifices worthwhile. When the Confederates looked at the campaigning season of 1864, it seemed to be more, uh, more of, a, of, a, of a mood of desperation and hanging on, uh, rather than a mood of optimism, that this is the year we'll win it. Uh, the hope was that this is the year we can convince the enemy that uh, their uh, war is futile, that we will never uh, allow ourselves uh, to be conquered. The mood in the North, in contrast, is one of confidence. People feel the war is finally coming to an end. It seemed that the advantages, the numerical superiority, the great industrial superiority was finally coming into place. The Northern troops were the best fed, best supplied that the world had ever seen. The Northern factories were going at full speed. The farms were producing huge crops, not just for the army and for the American people, but for Europe. Things looked so good. And then Ulysses S. Grant came to Washington, D.C. to take control of the army. And finally, it seemed as if there would be a leader, a military leader, who could work with President Lincoln. At least that's what Lincoln said. Lincoln said, Grant is my man and I am his until the end of the war. And with that statement profoundly linked the fortunes of the army and the presidency. People are confident that Grant will come up with a winning plan. Grant's plan was like himself, simple and direct. He said, we need to activate all of our men, all of our soldiers. And if we can do that, we will be able to conquer and defeat the Southern armies in the field. That plan became part of the great Overland Campaign, 
which began in the months of April and May and continued in May and June of 1864, proved to be sadly just as a difficult campaign as all the other campaigns against Robert E. Lee. While Grant is in Virginia with George Meade, the general who has led the Army of the Potomac since Gettysburg, William Sherman commands Union troops in the West. After defeating Confederate forces in Atlanta, he begins his infamous March to the Sea. Sherman had already declared, in one way or another, that war is uh, not fun, that war is hell. And Sherman, I think, believed that it was his duty to make war as terrible as he possibly could in order to convince the Confederates that uh, it was in their best interest to submit. And he did this, shaking out his army in three different columns across much of middle Georgia, all the way from Atlanta to uh, Savannah. The campaign took perhaps six weeks, from November uh, to uh, December 21st, when Savannah fell. The presence of the Union Army, so deep within the South, also has its effect on the slave population. Slaves in the interior uh, begin to demand wages, begin to open up new kinds of negotiations with their masters from a much more powerful uh, position. And of course, the mechanisms for control over the slave uh, population have been weakened, of course, again, changes that balance of power. And in many cases, they became restive and inspired fears on the part of Confederates that they were going to open the way to a slave insurrection. Uh, what primarily happened was slaves voted with their feet <laughs> and ran away. As soon as Union armies came within perhaps 20 miles and they knew about the presence of federal armies even though their masters often tried to conceal that information from them. A common term was grease, which was news from the war. So slavery is both being pounded from without by the movement of the Union Army into the South and, of course, uh, slaves running away uh, to the army, uh, being transformed into soldiers, coming back, liberating their families, becoming liberators of their people, so that we see that the process of emancipation is going on both on the ground, that is, in terms of what slaves are doing, even as it's going on in the kind of high politics in Congress. In Virginia, the Grant-Meade campaign against Lee during the summer and fall of 1864 is not making much headway. Those battles have gone down in history as being some of the bloodiest of this or any other war. The casualties were unbelievably high. And not only that, but this was a different kind of war, the war in 1864. It wasn't like Gettysburg, where you meet for three days. It wasn't like the other battles, where you meet for two or three days and you either stalemate or you have a victory and then you go back to your camps. No, it was a grinding day after day after day engagement of forces. The result was slaughter. Uh, indeed, the troops, many of them, uh, realized they could not live in the open and so used their little tin cups and mess kits to try to, to dig holes for themselves to get lower. They remained in front of Lee's army. Grant, after Cold Harbor, managed to do something that uh, no other commander had ever done. Jeb Stuart, Lee's trusted field officer, had been killed only a few weeks before, attempting to turn back a raid on Richmond. Always, Lee had had Stuart's cavalry to tell him where the Union Army was moving, or in which direction at least, and in what strength. And now, for a crucial few days after uh, Cold Harbor, Grant was able to uh, free himself from Lee's eyes. What he did was cross the James River and move on the rail junction of Petersburg, about 23 miles below Richmond. If you control Petersburg, you control the railroads, and you gradually tighten a vice on the capital of the Confederacy. Petersburg thus became a significant point to defend. Initially, Lee was not convinced that that was the thrust of Grant's attack. He didn't know. From his defensive position at Petersburg, 
Beauregard appeals for reinforcements. At one point, he had maybe 1,500 defenders against 35, 30 some odd thousand Union attackers. These troops, however, remembered Cold Harbor, remembered the futility of frontal attacks. They had been confronting Lee for over a month now. Grant had lost uh, really an average of 2,000 men a day over that month-long period in terms of casual, not all killed, but casualties. And so the Cold Harbor Syndrome, as one historian has termed it, gave these troops a certain caution as they approached Confederate works hastily erected to defend Petersburg. Lee sends reinforcements just in time to preserve the stalemate, even though his forces are outnumbered two to one. Lee was able to maintain the, the deadlock, keep the enemy at bay, keep Richmond alive as Confederate capital, with a surprisingly small number of troops using the advantage of the trenches, prepared fortifications, all kinds of fallen trees, impediments to attacking those trenches. And so you had a terrible situation that had grave consequences for Lincoln because it, it was clear that the war wasn't going to be ended quickly as everyone had hoped. 1864 is a presidential election year, a dangerous and depressing time for the embattled president. The Southerners believed that the Confederacy would be recognized by the North and allowed to exist as a nation if Lincoln could be replaced as a presidential candidate. A Democratic candidate could win. And Lincoln himself believed that. He had a little bit of trouble with his own party to get renominated in 1864. Abraham Lincoln, as late as August of 1864, was convinced that uh, his campaign for re-election was doomed, that he uh, wasn't going to win. The entire Union war effort was really uh, up for reaffirmation by the voters in the United States. Lincoln rushed to get Nevada into the Union to secure Nevada's three electoral votes. Now, three electoral votes are not that many, but Lincoln believed that they would or could be important. However, the day after the Democrats elected a man whom they thought would be the winner in the 1864 election, George McClellan, Atlanta fell to Sherman. Sherman wired Lincoln, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. I can't tell you what a big part that played, that great victory played in backing Lincoln for the 1864 election. And it goes to show you how closely tied the battlefield was to the home front. Once Sherman took Atlanta, once he started his march through Georgia, things seemed to go much better for the Union Army. Lincoln makes sure, however, that each Union soldier receives a ballot and a chance to vote. Believing, and correctly so, that soldiers would affirm the war effort in which they were so uh, desperately involved. As it turned out, Lincoln won, and in hindsight, rather handily. Nevertheless, the election of 1864 was a critical turning point. For most of the Civil War, in the winter, the armies were in camp. There wasn't a lot of fighting going on. Lincoln said to the Congress in the winter of 1864, let's pass this 13th Amendment now. Let's show this country and show the, the world that we are going to erase the stain from our nation once and for all. Put it in the Constitution. Believe it or not, there was still a lot of opposition to emancipation, but there was enough arm twisting by Lincoln and other Republicans where finally, in the spring, it did pass. Lincoln's second inaugural speech sets the tone for Reconstruction that Lincoln wants, and that tone is a generous leniency, and he wants the Southerners to know that he would welcome them back on generous terms, but they do have to accept emancipation. He will not let that go, ever. In spring of 1865, there was an expectation of victory in the air. It was now just a matter of time. Both commanders attempted to break the trench deadlock. Lee with a, a raid on Washington conducted by Jubilee Early and about oh, 18,000 of Lee's troops. 
Early was able to threaten Washington, but ultimately Early's troops had to withdraw into the valley and uh, Philip Sheridan ran into ground, literally, dispersed his army and all but destroyed it. Grant's attempt to break the deadlock of the trenches in front of Petersburg uh, came in the form of a, of a mine, an explosion. Grant asks some Western Pennsylvania miners for advice on how to undermine the Confederate fortifications. They dug a significant mine, tunnel, under the Confederate works. They planted 8,000 pounds of gunpowder. Uh, they set it off and then were to pour a reinforced army corps in the excess of 20,000 troops through this opening. A division of African Americans had rehearsed and trained to pour into this opening, secure the, the shoulders of this opening, and maintain it wide open to pour troops into the Confederate rear. At the last minute, however, Grant and Meade became concerned that if the plan didn't work, and these people became cannon fodder. How would that look back home? So they replaced the black division with a white one. As it happened, the troops did not press through the crater into the Confederate rear. Instead, did things like trying to take captured artillery pieces, which had been blown in the air, of course, uh, back to their own line, so that when the Confederates came back, it was literally like shooting fish in a barrel, and they were eager to do that. The Battle of the Crater essentially began about 5.30 in the morning and was over by 11 o'clock at a cost of maybe 4,400 casualties on the part of the Union. Ultimately, the Union's greater troop strength proves decisive. Lee just was unable to expand his army into the, the trenches far enough to keep the Federals at bay. On April 2nd, in response to a general attack all along the uh, front, Lee sent a very fateful telegram to Jefferson Davis that he would not be able to hold until dark, and uh, he hoped he could hold that long. When Petersburg fell, Richmond fell shortly afterwards. The Confederate cabinet led by Jefferson Davis escaped just hours before Union troops entered the city. Lee and his army were racing through the Virginia countryside, hoping to turn southward to meet up with Joe Johnson's last remaining major Confederate army who was in North Carolina. The army lasted one week outside of its trenches, which I think is some evidence of how important the trenches were and how significant that method of warfare was. By April 9th, Grant had infantry in front of Lee as well as behind him. And Lee did what he said he would rather die a thousand deaths than do, that is, go and see General Grant, in which he surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia. It all came to an end at a little southern crossroad town called Appomattox. The surrender took place, ironically, in the home of a man named Wilbur McLean, who had lived on the battlefield at Manassas or Bull Run, and had determined to take his family to a place of greater safety. But in the McLean parlor, Grant and Lee met. Lee, who had really been wearing a brand new uniform or a very resplendent uniform ever since April 2nd, the day he had had to abandon Richmond, came in and offered Grant his sword. Grant, who was mud spattered, wearing the, the cap of a, of a Union private, his dress, I think, too, was calculated to show him as the active commander, the man in the field, just as Lee wanted to show himself as the properly dressed losing commander, doing those things which Lee believed he should do, which was to offer his sword, which Grant refused. Grant's terms were generous. Lee's army was paroled, that is, as long as they wouldn't raise their hand or take up arms against the United States, they were free. This was a significant move, and Grant was aware of what he was doing. Actually, the troops, I think, had greater respect for each other than many civilians had for the opposition, because they had fought so long and so hard. Indeed, one federal officer was said to have mused that he thought he would spend the rest of his life fighting Confederate soldiers. In military terms, the long war is over. 
Even though Jefferson Davis refuses to accept defeat, fleeing south from Richmond before he is captured in Georgia. A few Southern diehards continue to fight, but even their resistance collapses before long. Now the difficult task of reuniting the shattered nation begins. The Unfinished Nation is a 52-part American history series. For more information about this program and accompanying materials, call 1-800-576-2988 or visit us online at www.intellicom.org.